And so what I'm going to talk about today is one of my areas of interest, which is how parenting and other environmental influences converge with factors that we usually think of as existing within the child, such as personality, to predict this future risk for antisocial behaviors. So I'm going to start by talking about uh, sort of brief history of how we've understood parenting effects or the relationship between what parents do and how their children turn out. Now, a few people would disagree that there is an association, and in some cases a very strong association, between what parents do and what children are like. Okay? It turns out that if you, if, you, if you measure those things, what parents are doing, what children turn out like, that um, parents who are responsive, supportive, consistent in their discipline, aren't harsh, um, use reasoning as a way of supporting the development of the children, that these children tend to do better in a lot of different ways. They tend to um, show fewer of these antisocial behaviors. They tend to be more successful occupationally in their relationships. They're more self-controlled. They do better at school. No one would doubt that there's a link there. The question is, what explains that correlation? And when we talk about correlations, there's, there's always more than one way to explain that link. Okay, so I'm going to present two extreme positions on explaining that link between parenting and children's social development. Okay, on one end, sort of the older perspective that uh, sort of emerges in the early 1900s, is that parenting has a strong influence on social development. If anything, it is the strongest influence in determining how children turn out. And so this has origins in psychoanalytic and behavioral theories, and although these two theories had lots to disagree about, one, one way in which they were very similar is that they both agreed that if anything is important, it is how parents treat their children, which in many ways was innovative for the time to think about how parenting had a, uh, was important to think about in, in, in terms of how a, children, uh, how a child would eventually turn out. And up here I have a quote that may be a little bit hard to read by John Watson, the father of behaviorism, which basically summarizes how extreme this position was, this idea that regardless of a child's particular personality, things that they come into the world with, those sort of trait-like characteristics that they have that differ between children, and anyone in here who has multiple children can appreciate that. But regardless of that, if given the right circumstances, if you had enough control over the environment, and you understood the mechanisms by which the environment shapes behavior, which is reliant on learning, then you could take any child and turn them into anything. And his examples are anything from a doctor, lawyer, artist, merchant chief, or beggarman, thief, or thief. Okay, so you can see how, how strong of a position this was. There is a negative consequence of this view. There's plenty of positive, right? This is empowering to parents. It suggests that we do make a difference. But the negative consequence of this view is that if we're going to say that parents are mainly responsible for when their children turn out well, we're also going to have to say that they're responsible when, when things don't go as well as we'd like or we face difficulties that we don't understand. Uh, and in fact, um, a good example of this is in the 1950s, there was a term coined the refrigerator mother. And this was meant to uh, describe the idea, a very popular idea at the time, that Mothers, in particular, were responsible for when their children uh, developed autism. It was also used to, to describe the development of schizophrenia. The idea being the refrigerator mother was, was cold and distant, and this was the cause of their child's uh, autism. Now we know that that is not at all the case, that parenting has ver very little to do with uh, autism as an initial cause, though parents do play an important part in supporting their children and developing their skills after the fact. We don't think of that as an important cause. Okay, so good and bad. Um, sort of consequences. Um, and, and when we think about this perspective today, it is still fairly popular as evidenced by my sampling of parenting books. Okay? We still tend to believe that parents have very strong influences. Uh, and that's a good thing. And this is a huge industry, hundreds of books. These are some of my favorites. Conscious parenting, probably much better than unconscious parenting. I think we can agree on that. Um, duct tape parenting. Now, notice this, <laughs> who's wearing the duct tape? It's the, it's the mom and dad. Okay, so... so uh, I'm gonna, and it's never too early to read, right? Making Child Mind Without Losing Yours. And my personal favorite, Guide to Pirate Parenting. I don't know what that's about, but how could that be bad, right? Okay, now I want to go to the other end of the spectrum. The position that parenting has very little, if any, influence on social development. Okay. According to this position, parents' influence is largely complete at conception. Okay. Once you provide those genes, it no longer makes that much of a difference what the parents are doing. Now, this isn't to suggest that parents could do nothing and expect their children to turn out well, but they weren't going to have much influence. As long as they were providing the bare minimum of care, the children were going to turn out how they would turn out, regardless of what else the, children, what else the parent did. So all those excellent books would go to waste. Right? And 
they're talking about the same association. They, didn't say, they weren't trying to claim that parenting and child outcomes weren't associated. They just had a different explanation for why. The previous perspective is what you might call a pure parent effects explanation. All the direction of effect is going from parent to child to their behavior. In this case, we're talking about that association being driven by another mechanism, and that is genetic influences. Okay. And there's a couple of ways in which that can happen. We can talk about passive genetic effects, where a common set of genes contribute to parenting behaviors and an easygoing, well developed, you know, socially adept child, but in fact, that's just the, the uh, combined effect of a single cause. So there's not actually any causal influence between the two. Another possibility, something we might refer to as an evocative effect, is that the genes that are passed on to the child help contribute to a personality that then can lead to a parent looking very good because the, parent is, the child is easy to manage or very bad because the child isn't so easy to manage. But the direction of effect goes from the child to the parent rather than the other way around. So you, so you see these two extremes. And the origins of this perspective are in genetically informed research. When we started doing large-scale studies of twins and using adoption designs, there was plenty of cases where we were surprised by the size of genetic effects and the relatively very small effect of what we called shared environment, which is usually what we think of as capturing uh, parenting influences. And these two books, there's m many fewer books that, that uh, sort of advocate this perspective, but these two are very important, The Limits of Family Influence by David Rowe and The Nurture Assumption by Judith Rich Harris, which said very strongly that, you know, the environment isn't that critical. It appears that, as it is because there is that correlation, uh, but for the most part, genes and other environmental experiences like peers are more important. Um, now, there is a negative consequence of this view as well, which is it suggests that parents are powerless. It doesn't matter what you do. We have no effect on our children's outcomes, which is equally dangerous. Now a third perspective, and one that uh, sort of sets up the, the, the research I'm going to tell you about, which is the integrative perspective. Um, first and foremost, it would suggest that, well, parenting effects depend on the child outcome under consideration. We can't simply say that parents do not matter or they matter a lot. We'd have to ask, considering what child outcome? So in the case of autism, like I said, uh, there's very consistent evidence that, that the parenting that a, that a uh, parent exhibits toward their child has no influence on whether the, the child develops autism. But when we talk about antisocial behavior, okay, that delinquency, that aggressive behavior, parents do play a part, as do genetics. Okay. Also, and what's more critical to understanding this integrative perspective is that the links between parenting and child behavior are understood to be both transactional and interactive. And what I mean by that is transactional refers to this reciprocal relationship between parent and child parents influence, but are also influenced by their child, okay? Um, and, you know, for those here who may be parents, maybe you can appreciate this. You have your first child, you feel like you know what you're doing, and then you have the second one, and part of the reason you have the second one is because the first one was relatively easy, and you're shocked to find that this child isn't responding to the same parenting characteristics you used to use. And so they may draw out in you a different sort of personality, a different way of reacting to the child. So that child in many ways is shaping or evoking particular parental responses. Secondly, the second part of what you might think of as an integrative perspective is this interactive piece, which basic, basically would just suggest that the magnitude or even the very direction of a parenting effect would depend on child characteristics among other factors that we might consider. And what I mean by that is that when you uh, are using a particular strategy in order to encourage pro-social behavioral development in your child, what works for child one may not work for child two depending on the personality characteristics of the child. Okay? And this is where we get into this concept of one size does not fit all, this goodness of fit that must exist between the child's characteristics and the parents for this to be a successful endeavor. Okay. So those environmental and genetic influences can fluctuate depending on these variables. Okay. And so what this means is that if we're going to understand things like the development of antisocial behavior, we're going to have to consider both child char characteristics and parenting in conjunction, focusing on these potentially uh, interactive and tra transactional processes. So now I want to turn to a child characteristic that is of interest to me because of my interest in the development of antisocial behavior. We can divide up child personality along many dimensions. But callous and emotional traits are interesting to me because they're one of the strongest child characteristics that are predictive of future risk for antisocial behavior. And by callous and emotional traits, I mean exhibiting a lack of remorse and guilt, showing constricted affective range or emotional range or at least emotional expression, demonstrating a lack of empathy or sort of understanding of the distress of others, 
and exhibiting superficial charm, so appearing to be conscientious and understanding and warm and responsive, but in fact using that in a manipulative way, perhaps. This, these features, this combination of features, uh, constitute the affective and interpersonal components of psychopathy, and, and I'm not going to get into psychopathy, but certainly there's a connotation that comes along with the idea of the psychopath. There are many links with antisocial behavior um, stemming from callous and emotional traits. Um, and it's not just that it increases risk, risk for garden variety antisocial behavior, the kind that we might even say is sort of typical for adolescents, where, parent, where children are testing limits, they're gaining independence, this sort of thing. Instead, we're saying that these callous, unemotional youths are at risk for early appearing, okay, persistent, more severe in form and, and, and quantity, uh, and instrumental, or what we might describe as goal-directed antisocial behavior, the, the more extreme version. These kids are much more likely to go on to start showing these behavior problems early and then to continue showing them into adulthood where it turns into um, sort of criminal behavior. It's become such an important characteristic that it was recently introduced as a specifier for something we call conduct disorder in the most recent revision of the Psychiatric Diagnostic Manual, or DSM-5. It's so important that we're saying we need to know this when we're diagnosing a child because it's going to affect prognosis, it's going to affect how we think we can help this child, and how we understand how the child came to this point. So, I'm going to turn back to the integrated model. We have to think about, well, what relevance does this have for understanding parenting? So, I'm going to step back for a second, and I'm going to talk about how callous and emot emotional traits may influence risk for antisocial behavior. What is the mechanism by which having these personality, personality characteristics lead to an increased risk for these problems? Well, one popular theory is that children with callous and emotional traits are, in fact, re have a reduced capacity for socialization. Okay, so they just don't have the range of reaction to the environment that we might otherwise see in other children. Um, there's a couple of lines of evidence that support this idea. One is that the influence of genetics on antisocial behavior is greater for kids who have these traits. Okay, so 80% of the variance in the risk is due to genetic factors in kids with callous and emotional traits, 20 to 30% in kids without these traits. Dramatic difference. What's left over is how much the environment is likely to matter. Very little left over in the case of callous and emotional youth. Also, there are findings suggesting that kids with these characteristics have show poor outcomes for behavior therapy and tended to reduce antisocial behavior. Parents report that timeout doesn't work as well with these kids. Okay. Um, there has been some research that has looked at parenting as sort of this, this combination of factors, not specific parenting practices or behaviors, but parenting more generally, good and bad parenting, um, that these parenting variables are typically associated with risk for antisocial behavior, but not so much for kids with callous and emotional traits. It appears that it doesn't have the same impact in influencing a child's long-term risk for antisocial behavior. And finally, and this becomes important because I'll, I'm going to try and uh, de develop a theme here, which is that these kids tend to be fearless, okay, and they don't learn well from negative consequences when completing learning tasks. Thing, the sort of things you might have them do in a laboratory, like in the past we've done things where they playing sort of a gambling task, where the odds of winning and losing when they, when they gamble change over time. They don't figure out that things that were previously reinforced in a very rich and frequent way are no longer being reinforced but are instead being punished, okay. suggesting that it could be a mechanism related to learning from negative consequences. Okay. But as far as the theory goes, it's more like these kids don't learn. They, they can't learn, they can't be influenced to the same degree, which is a very hopeless perspective in, in my mind. So how does parenting okay, typically influence antisocial behavior? Okay. And so we can, we can think across a couple dimensions of parenting. Parenting is a complex thing, and I'm not going to capture it all here, but in general we can talk about parenting style, which is the overall emotional climate of the parent-child relationship. This is sort of the... the um, the degree to which the parent exhibits warmth or hostility toward the child, the degree to which they're responsive versus rejecting, anticipating the needs of the child, in general, show positivity toward the child. And, and these, these we think of as like not really contingent aspects of parenting. They're not determining this positivity or negativity depending on what the child is doing, but rather it's the emotional tone of the relationship. It turns out that hostility is typically, has typically been associated with higher risk for antisocial behavior. Okay. Uh, the second aspect of parenting 
uh, that I want you to consider is something we'd refer to as child behavior management practices. And these refer more to the specific behaviors that you direct toward a child with the goal of changing a behavior. Okay, these are contingent responses to child behavior. Okay. You do certain things to promote pro-social pro behavior. You provide labeled praise. You say, oh, this is what I like to see. If you have an adolescent, you may um, give them extra pr privileges or extend their curfew. These sort of things that when they do a good job, you want to encourage that behavior. Okay. On the other hand, you may do things, provide negative consequences to discourage misbehaviors in arranging from things like removing privileges, shortening that curfew, taking away the car keys or the phone or whatever it might be. Those are contingent and they're goal-oriented. Okay. These are also found to be associated with risk for antisocial behavior in longitudinal studies, such that parents who are more consistent and consistently send the message that engaging in pro-social and constructive behaviors will lead to good consequences and who consistently show that engaging in negative behaviors will lead to negative consequences, have children who tend to develop or are more likely to show pro-social behaviors over time. They turn out better. Okay, so I want to turn now to the study that, that I conducted that sort of brought these two things together, callous and emotional traits and parenting as we understand it. And so what I have observed in that literature that I very quickly described in the callous and emotion, related to callous and emotional traits and socialization is that is it really the case that children with callous and emotional traits are uh, sort of inaccessible, that they don't respond to socialization, or is it in fact an underlying insensitivity to punishment? Okay. Now, I just described parenting as something being much grander than simply the use of punishment. There are other mechanisms by which parenting, parents are thought to influence their children. So I wanted to explore this question. Now, you may be asking yourself, I just told you that the genetic effects on antisocial behavior are really large for callous and emotional traits. So how is it possible that kids are more responsive to an environment than would be suggested by those results? And the answer is, if these kids are evoking the very parenting that they're not responsive to, the genetic effects increase. Okay. So if there's transactional effects, such that having a callous and emotional child brings out greater levels of hostility, or negativity, or use of, or use of punitive uh, sort of practices to discourage behavior, well then you're going to be creating an environment that's not going to show up in those studies when you divide it between genetic and environmental influences. So here we turn back to that integrative model of parent uh, and child behavior. So these are the particular questions I wanted to, to answer. One is, are youth's behaviors shaped by their parents' positive and negative behaviors? I had to establish this first because using the design I, I'm going to describe, this has been demonstrated consistently. So I first had to show that this is the case, generally, without regard to callous and emotional traits. Secondly, are positive and negative parenting behaviors associated with, with callous and emotional traits? In other words, are we seeing this, this, uh, the evidence that callous and emotional traits are bringing out more negativity from the parents, setting up this possible sequence where parents are using behaviors that are less effective for callous and emotional trait, trait uh, children? And finally, the interactive part, part of this is, do effects of parents' positive and negative behaviors vary according to youth callous and unemotional traits, and if so, in what ways? Is it really socialization at large? Are they just not susceptible to parenting uh, influences at all? Or is it a particular pattern, like I would predict that it would be contingent negative responses that they would be uh, unresponsive to? So the sample included 384 families from the Child Development Project. This is a 28-year longitudinal study um, that was very interested in how social development looks over time. Uh, there is some diversity in the sample. It's about 85% white, 15% black. Um, gender was evenly split between uh, boys and girls and the, and the children. Of course, the parents were involved too. And it's primarily middle class, but it does have a non-trivial um, portion of, of families that were in the lower two tiers of socioeconomic categories. And so it, it is a diverse sample in that regard to some extent. It is really what we describe a community sap sample. It looks very much like the communities from which the samples were drawn. The measures that I used, first, measuring callous and emotional traits. Well, at age 16, these uh, participants described the very traits that I told you were core to callous and emotional traits, and this is a well-validated measure. It does predict these outcomes that I've talked about. And we also videotaped parent-youth interactions, conflict discussions as they took place in the home. This is a way of understanding parenting because you can see it happen in real time. You can see how parents and kids interact. And we, can, and we used a, a well-validated coding system to break down all the behaviors that the teens and their parents were showing along positive, negative, and neutral um, categories. And what we did then is we looked at the interaction sequences. So then we could begin to look at both contingent 
parenting effects and non-contingent. What were those parents doing in terms of their negativity and positivity in a non-contingent way, similar to what we think of as the parenting style or warmth or versus hostility, versus what are those contingent effects that are more like parenting practices? Okay, so this is a way, and then we can see what do the kids do in the actual task? Do we see any evidence of parental effects within the task? Okay. Do, does the child's behavior change throughout the task depending on what the parents are doing? Now, there's a reason that we're looking at this in this fine-grained way that's focused on the interaction. Parents can report on some aspects of the parenting. They can say, are they warm, are they responsive, are they hostile? But what they're really bad at, and this comes from both research literature but also working in clinics when you talk to parents who describe what they do with their, with their children, what they've tried before to manage their children's behavior, is that they're not very good at describing what they do in a contingent sort of way. They'll say, well, I use timeout, but it becomes clear that in many cases they're using these in uh, haphazard ways or they're in many ways unknowingly reinforcing negative behaviors or um, punishing or failing to reinforce positive behaviors. So observing parent-child interactions allows for a more fine-grained analysis, a sort of a way to look at parental influence in real time, okay, that then we can think about how it transfers to the long term. And this approach is very much consistent with what we call social learning accounts of antisocial behavior development, which suggests that contingencies and parent relationships with children do matter. So on to the results. Question one, are youth's behaviors shaped by their parents' positive and negative behaviors? In this brief interaction, do we actually see any evidence that there was any influence on the, on the teen's behavior? And yes, we did, in two ways. One, not surprisingly, teens were happy to reciprocate negativity. <laughs> if parents in general, in a non-contingent way, were expressed criticism, disapproval, these sort of things, kids were happy to respond in kind. The same was true for positive interactions. Uh, the more that the parents exhibited positive behaviors were warm, the, the greater the likelihood that the kids were more likely to exhibit sort of poor, positive behaviors within the interaction. More likely to say, yeah, right, I'll, I'll try that solution, take responsibility for the conflict they may be discussing, these sort of things that we would like to see children be able to do. Um, in addition, we saw evidence for a punishment effect. Okay? Even in the short period of time, if parents, the degree to which parents were reliably and consistently responding negatively to a certain pattern of behavior in the children, the children did less of that as the task went on. Okay. That's in general, not in relationship to callous and emotional traits. So we, we do see evidence of parenting effects that was successful. Secondly, are positive and negative parenting behaviors associated with callous and emotional traits? Yes, they were. Perhaps not surprisingly, and consistent with the predictions, callous and emotional use experienced higher rates of parental negativity and lower rates of parental positivity. Okay. So they were... It, 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 this suggests, but it doesn't prove that they were in some ways evoking greater negativity than the kids with less of these callous and emotional traits, which is sort of a dimensional characteristic. In addition, and probably related to the top finding, is that these youths, if they had greater callous and emotional traits, they tended to exhibit fewer positive behaviors during the interaction. This could have been the vehicle by which it created this sort of response of negativity on behalf of the parent, consistent with the transactional model. And then finally, do effects of parents' positive and negative behavior vary according to youth callous and emotional traits, and if so, in what ways? What we found is that callous and emotional youths, okay, these kids that were high in these, in these characteristics, were equally responsive to overall parental negativity and positivity. They reciprocated in the same way. They were very positive and constructive in these discussions if the parents approached it in a positive way. If the parents approached it in a negative way, they tended to also be very negative. What was different, though, is consistent with expectations, callous and emotional use were unresponsive to that punishment effect I just described. They showed no evidence of any suppression of their behaviors dependent on the contingencies they were experiencing based on their parents' responses. Okay. Very quickly, I'm going to try and explain what's going on here. This is sort of like a prototypical description of what kind of behaviors we saw, how behaviors were distribu distributed across the task for kids at very low levels of callous and emotional traits as compared to those with very high callous and emotional traits. If we saw a punishment effect, this is what we'd see. The rate of children's behavior across negative and positive categories would vary according to the consequences provided. Okay, so here on the right with the green, you see this is under conditions where parents were likely to punish negative behaviors at a higher rate than positive behaviors. We see the children responding to that. Here we see that the, the, um, there's a high rate of negative consequences being provided for positive behaviors versus negative behaviors. So we see that changing across those conditions. On the right side, we see this flat line. There was no effect. It was an, a, an estimate of zero in terms of the degree to which there was an association between the rate at which parents were responding, or responding negatively to different child behaviors and the rate at which that influenced the actual distribution of the child's behaviors. 
no effect whatsoever. That's why these lines are flat. It didn't matter. It didn't matter. The kids did what they did. So what does this mean? Well, it suggests that calisthenic motion use are, are in fact punishment insensitive, even in this setting of the social interaction. And it suggests that parents' use of negative consequences to punish antisocial behavior is likely to be ineffective for callous unemotional use or may even be experienced as reinforcing because at high enough levels of callous unemotional traits, we see a reversal effect where if you're going to punish me for this, I'm going to become even more negative. It's going to be the opposite of what we'd expect. However, and this is the bright side of it, is that callous unemotional use are responsive to this non-contingent positivity. They're responsive to what we might think of as sort of prototypical warmth. Unfortunately, however, callous unemotional use are less likely to elicit the very parenting that they're, 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 they're going to be responsive to. So taking together, the findings suggest that, again, callous and emotional youths are likely to elicit the kind of parenting that is ineffective, and that parenting interventions need to look a little different for these kids. Okay? They should focus on developing positive parent-child relationships, and we have another number of methods for doing this, like scheduling time together to do positive activities together. Okay? Uh, encouraging the use of positive reinforcement for constructive behaviors and discouraging punitive responses to child misbehavior and hostility as much as possible, or at least making those less central to the, the sort of tenor of the relationship that exists between the parent and the child. Now, more work has to be done before we can really understand this in, a, in greater detail because I haven't yet linked it to antisocial behavior. This is more evidence of influence, but how it links to antisocial behavior would be a future direction of research. <laughs>